Um, and I think um, we will now move to um, Karsten, um, uh, Dr. Karsten Schubert, um, for um, you know more complexity thinking, if you will, <laughs> around context. Um, so Dr. Karsten Schubert is Assistant Professor for Political Theory and Philosophy at the Albert Ludwigs University of Freiburg. His work focuses on contemporary critical political theory and social philosophy, Michel Foucault, radical democracy, legal critique, biopolitics, queer and gay theory, and intersectionality. Um, and currently, Karsten is researching at the intersection of critical legal theory and the ethics of social criticism. Prior to um, his appointment at um, the Albert Ludwigs University of Freiburg, he received his PhD in philosophy at the University of Leipzig and his book, Freedom as Critique, Social Philosophy um, after Foucault uh, was published um, in 2018. So over to you, Karsten. Yes, thank you so much, Oli, for this kind introduction and the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. And uh, I think it will be an amazing panel after I heard Miharika's talk. And uh, also thank you, Karen. Um, so I will talk about biopolitics and uh, in the pandemic. And I have structured in this paper in, two par uh, in three parts. First, I introduce the term biopolitics. Then I talk about the question, if we are currently experiencing a state of exception. And then I explain how I understand the term democratic biopolitics in difference to populist biopolitics. And it's really, um, it, it's really working well, I think, together with Miharika's talk. Um, because it's also a lot about the pathologies in everyday life and uh, the norms which are reinforced um, through the pandemic, but which have been there and structuring our social lives already. So the first part is biopolitics as differentiated vulnerability. The term biopolitics was coined by Michel Foucault. Foucault was concerned with power, that is how people are governed and what techniques are used for government, how they relate to knowledge and science. Biopolitics now is a certain form of power that emerged in the late 18th and in the 19th century and which still shapes our present times. Biopolitics means, according to Foucault, that government finds a new object a new object, and that is life. More precisely, the population and its health, birth rates, death rates, etc. New technologies of power and new kinds of knowledges, such as medical and statistical knowledges, were developed to influence the population, the life of the population. Very central in this is the surveillance and control of sexuality, but also the emerging systems of insurance and welfare. And this really is a historical rupture. Never before politics has taken care of biological processes in such a way and in such a scientific way. And I would like to also highlight that biopolitics is a concept for a more precise analysis of capitalism than Marxism alone can provide. And this is important because traditionally in the social theoretical scene, Foucault and Marxism are seen in a fundamental contradiction. As Foucault often spoke as a critic um, of Marxism of his days. But I see Foucault's critique of Marxism as a rather internal critique among fellow social theorists and not as a fundamental critique. Capitalist mass production is based, among other things, on complex biopolitics and we cannot understand capitalism without biopolitics. Foucault's use of the concept biopolitics is both descriptive, that is analytical and explanatory, and at the same time, normative and critical. He describes biopolitics grip on individuals and the technologies of power in such a way that it is clear that repression is at work. 
not only through targeted action to discipline and normalize individuals, but also by letting die those who are less relevant in biopolitical considerations. And here you already see some connections to Niharika's talk. Furthermore, according to Foucault, biopolitics is fundamentally connected with racism. As soon as the population and its health and hygiene became a policy issue, distinctions were made between races, and that means more precisely between the worthy and the unworthy life. According to Foucault, the Third Reich and the Holocaust are thus a radicalization of this form of power that still shapes all of modernity. And here you can see the connection to inequality. Biopolitics means making distinctions. A Warwick colleague, uh, Daniele Lorenzini, has described biopolitics as politics of differentiated vulnerability. It has always been about protecting some and exposing others to vulnerability even until death. The examples for this differentiated vulnerability in the current COVID situation are plentiful, and we heard a lot of them um, in the case of India just now. Um, but for the German case, think of different working conditions between the home office class and low-income workers in the meat and plant picking industry um, that had COVID outbreaks in Germany, for example, or um, at Europe, uh, Europe's borders, the situation in the refugee camps. So I'm coming now to the second part. Is COVID a state of exception? There has been a lot of talk about the COVID situation as um, a state of exception. And Niharika just told us how these rhetorics were also used um, for political ends. And of course, the situation is in some way exceptional because the state intervenes in a different way with restrictions in areas of life that are normally much less regulated. I don't say here it intervenes much more because I think that we are sometimes or mostly caught in liberal ideology where we don't see how much our life is thoroughly regulated by politics. For example, a free and unregulated market is the result of a specific regulatory framework that creates the extreme inequalities that people often see as a given. So the state now intervenes differently, but not necessarily more. With Foucault, one could say, what happens is not exceptional, but expectable. We see com contemporary repetitions and mixes of old political forms, such as discipline, the individualization of responsibility, security technologies based on statistical and medical knowledge. But one can, um, but nothing has changed fundamentally. And one can see that also with alternative sociological approaches. Um, I name just two, for example, Andreas Reckwitz and Armin Nassihi, two major German sociologists wrote, we see typical risk politics on the one hand, a well-known sociological phenomena, or in a more systems theoretical idiom, we see the typical modern society at work, at least here in the case of Germany. All functional systems play exactly the roles they are supposed to play. So what we see is a state of exception rather in a directly phenomenal, phenomenal sense. One experiences it as an exception, but fundamentally in social and political systems, in discourses, in power mechanisms, not much has changed. That the situation is not exceptional in this fundamental sense also entails that our experiences of exceptionality in our concrete lives are highly differentiated according to our social position. That nothing has changed fundamentally means that the lives of many vulnerable people change dramatically to the worse, while well-off well people also get off well in the pandemic on average. 
This is just the non-exceptional continuation of the exploitation mechanisms of biopolitical capitalism. However, the situation is truly exceptional in the economic sense. I am still amazed and also disappointed that leftist forces have not managed to put the demand for more radical redistribution on the agenda now that the state has financed enormous economic aids with new debts. Here, protest and politicization would be so important and also so obvious, but neoliberalism, sadly, is still firmly in her saddle. So now the third part, is democratic biopolitics possible? So the question is now what options we have and what follows from biopolitical theory, except for this very depressing analysis of the continuation of old power structures. My term for good biopolitics is democratic biopolitics. However, this is not so much about what concrete things should be done now in this situation, but more a theoretical contribution to the normativity in biopolitical theory, and it offers a reflection of the role of the state and the civil society in the pandemic. And again, this is coming from this particular German or maybe Western Europe perspective. Traditionally, Foucault's analysis of power has been used to describe social structures that affect individuals in a restrictive, disciplining, and norming manner. In other words, it is about repressive power. Such analysis describes the state, the law, and science, and their joint exercise of power, which, to put it bluntly, keeps capitalism running and subtly keeps people in their respective functions. The concept of democratic biopolitics can help to get away from this somewhat schematic analysis and describe that biopolitics is a rather complex political negotiation in which democratic decision-making processes already play or at least should play a role. And thus it is also a descriptive and a normative term. The concept of democratic biopolitics is not mine. It has been discussed by other colleagues in the analysis of Corona, and I have participated in this discussion. George Agamben, well-known old veteran of repressive biopolitics, saw total state repression and even the comeback of Nazism in the government of COVID. And Panagiotis Sotiris, against Agamben, wrote about the possibility of democratic biopolitics, which he understood as a matter of a free and communal development of biopolitical ethics, communal as opposed to state organized. I intervened in this debate to criticize the still pretty simple oppositional scheme of repressive state power and free democratic community or civil society. In order to define the concept of democratic biopolitics more precisely, I suggested a contrasting term, populist biopolitics. This is a form of decay of democratic biopolitics, which points to the danger that can arise from the unmediated and grassroots-based norm setting that Sotiris understood by the term democratic biopolitics. Populist biopolitics is characterized, borrowing now from political theories of populism, by the act of setting a position as absolute, morally right, indisputable, and in the interest of the real people. In case of COVID, that interest is to protect the people from infection, and all other goals must take second place behind this. So this is essentially an anti-pluralist and absolutist position as in classical populism. And I saw such populist biopolitics in many social media contributions in the early pandemic, especially in the US context where state control was low, but also in Germany where the state from the very beginning um, had more or less reasonable um, epidemiological 
responses. All over social media was the slogan, stay the fuck at home. And the absolutist position was visible in many aggressive acts of shaming in online discussions. In the summer, the phenomenon reoccurred with the scandalization of unreasonable young people who were shamed because they were partying and note that they were partying outside with masks and it was kind of really not a dangerous thing to do, but still it was very scandalized. What I wanted to point at um, is that at its core, community ethics tend to be repressive and normalizing and not liberating. Minorities in particular know this. One core example for such populist biopolitics with community ethics as repressive and stigmatizing is the AIDS crisis and HIV related stigma until today. This allows now to refine how we should understand democratic biopolitics in the COVID crisis. It is not mainly about community ethics and grassroots action. Rather, it must be based in, on public negotiations and discourse involving science, and it must stay within the framework of the rule of law, making sure that cuts on basic rights are necessary and useful. It is inherently pluralistic because it's such uncertain knowledge, and there is no absolute right solution, only a weightening of various risk and the consequential risks which are created by making decisions. For example, the economic and psychological damages done by lockdown measures. Populist biopolitics, in contrast, tends to be only focused on corona as the one core, single, and absolute issue. Now, of course, the biopolitics of COVID are not democratic, not democratic yet, maybe. So they should be democratized. And that means, in particular, better access to and representation of weaker voices that are not heard in the democratic deliberations, especially at a time where it is no longer a matter of preventing hospitals from running at capacity, but of reducing risk. It is also a political question of negotiating the importance of different lifestyles. For example, how important leisure, nightlife, and culture are in relation to the economy, or how important Christmas is. Now everybody in Germany is focused on Christmas. Everybody wants to keep Christmas safe, and therefore we have stricter measures now. But not everybody, not Christmas is not so important for everybody. Overall, COVID politics in Germany follow a rather heteronormative script. The most central question, however, for the democratization of COVID politics is, I think, the question of who pays for the debts that the governments took on to save the economy. It would entail breaking out of the discursive limits of neoliberalism and austerity politics and introduce a wealth tax to make the rich pay for COVID. Thank you very much.